Hey guys, welcome to Musky Road Rules Podcast, episode number 266. Guys, thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in to us every week. You can find us on all types of podcast outlets. You can find us on Spotify, Amazon. You can find us on iTunes. All you need to do, though, and write this down, if anybody's listening... Hit subscribe. Please hit the subscribe button, and then we're going to come to your phone every week or however you listen to these things. Um, we're going to come to you every week. Tonight's podcast is brought to you by Musky Road Rules Seminars. Guys, we got the first one of the year coming up. We're not doing as many this year. It was just a, a weird year, but <clears throat> we're going to be at Sportsman's Repair uh, in uh, Mosinee, Wisconsin, we're going to be there on this Saturday. It's going to start at 10 a.m., go to 4. Um, we've got two really good speakers and one not so great. Um, we've got uh, we've got Nate Osfar, we've got Gus Manti, and we've got some guy named Michael Hansen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and it, he's giggling. Uh, that uh, at that one, it's going to be cool. I'm going to be doing a little talk as well. So, uh, 45 bucks at the door, or you can register online via PayPal at muskyroadrolls.com. You can sign up there. And then on Sunday, we're going to be in the Minneapolis area. I'm going to be at Thorn Brothers. Um, and again, it's 10 to 4, and it's going to be me, uh, Luke Ronestrand, that deadbeat. And a couple guys from Fish Electronics are going to talk electronics. Luke's going to talk a lot about equipment. Uh, and then I'm going to do a talk as well. It's going to be pretty cool. And then the following weekend at uh, Nishwa up there in Brainerd, Wisconsin, uh, we're going to have one. It's going to be David Holmes, who's a river fisherman. He's got a really cool seminar. And Doug Wigner. Uh, is going to be at that one speaking along with myself. So these things are going to be pretty cool. Make sure you check out the website, muskyroadrules.com. You can sign up right there, or you can just pay at the door. Women and children are free. Um, so, guys, don't be wearing wig and high heels to try to get into this thing free. I'm going to be doing a, a cup check when you walk in. So uh, <laughs> make sure you're uh, make sure you're behaving yourselves. And guys, always remember we'd love to t- get some text. You can text us on our text line. It's the Lungeon Lures text line six zero six seven seven six six five seven zero. Shoot us a text. Let us know how you're doing. Let us know how the winter's been treating you. And remember, it's sponsored by Lungeon Lures. Uh, makers of the 22 short, 22 long, 22 SS, the chubby alley cat series of lures like the stray cat, the little LP and the rattle and shad, which is going to be coming up here pretty soon, guys. It's going to get, uh, uh, the Southern stuff's going to definitely get going, but, uh, Yeah, so on the podcast tonight, guys, we're going to listen to two people. We're going to talk to Michael Hansen from up in the Hayward area, and we're going to talk to Colin Hall, a bait maker there in Ohio who was at the Ohio show last weekend. Guys, how you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Well, good. I am out of breath. I need a drink drink of water. I I do that all from memory. None of that's written down. I'm very impressed with myself. You can be too. Uh, that's all uh, for memory. I'm doing that, and I've got the Kentucky Florida game uh, on mute that I'm watching. So if you hear me swear, it just means that they're annoying me again. But uh, guys, let's talk. Uh, Colin, I met you um, at the Ohio show last weekend. Why don't you tell everybody kind of you know what's your bait company name and and uh, you know how you kind of got into this. Sure. Um, the company name is Creek Hog Baits. Uh, the way I got into lure making. Lost a bet. No, no. Actually, it was probably, uh, I think, like 2015 or 2016. You're not that uh, old. Was it in high school? Was this a wood shop project? No, no. Um, <laughs> Jesus. And uh, I'm trying to remember. So my buddy John, um, the gentleman that got me into the Creek Muskie fishing, <laughs> uh, he... Uh, he had like an incredible season, uh, and he was just like running crane baits, like crane two hundred five, two hundred six. Sure, and taking a lot of fish with those. And my other buddy Bill and I, um, you know, naturally after that, we were like, "Oh, we gotta get some crane baits." And it just happened to be like a, a time period where they were just like out of stock everywhere, and there was just like 
couldn't find any cranes. Sure. Well, I mean, and, there are, you know, Bill and Sharon uh, are definitely getting up there in age. So it's, yeah. I tell everybody, if you want cranes, keep buying them because Bill's 83. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I met him for the first time actually last year. Um, oh, nice. The Oak River. But. Yeah, so we couldn't get cranes, and uh, my buddy Bill was like, I don't know, maybe we like, maybe we can like try to make our own crane face. And so he actually bought like a little bandsaw and sander, and we kind of went to work. Um, and naturally, the first couple baits we made were just hideous, and none of them worked. Uh, we kind of went through a, a couple iterations and still couldn't really get anything to work. Pretty much had no idea what we were doing. Um, and he kind of just ended up being kind of done with it and was like, eh, I'm over it. Um, myself, I was like determined to try to get them to work. Uh, it's just like my personality. If I can't get something going, like I'll just, I'll exhaust myself trying to get it to work. Um, and so eventually got some baits to work, uh, and then eventually caught some fish on my own baits and it just like sparked something in me. Uh, and then it was like, okay, I can make crank baits. Like what's the other type of lures that? Or out there, like started looking at everything, started making glide baits. I'm uh, just starting to mess around, and just recently started dabbling in the soft plastics. So, yeah, that's I just ended up getting addicted to it. And now so. at the show, did you have any hard baits there, or was it all soft plastics? I did not have any hard baits at the show. Um, I just had soft plastics. Yeah, that's what I thought. You had some really cool looking soft plastics. As a side note, though, if Bill Crane ever offers you a drink um, out of uh, any bottle that he's drinking out of, uh, be ready. No matter what he tells you it is, it is moonshine. Um, <laughs> I learned that uh, the hard way. When we were at a show one time and Bill, you know, Bill at this time was in his late seventies and he goes, do you want to, you know, or you look thirsty, you need a, do you need a fuse? And I go, what is a fuse? And it, at the time fuse was like this energy, you know, like this, I don't know, like a Gatorade style drink that you would yeah. find. And uh, he goes, do you need it? And I'm like, why is this old guy just, you know, re- hounding me about this fuse? And then finally one time I go, yeah, I took a swallow of that. I don't know what the proof was, but it was a lot. It uh, it lit the fuse. That's all I'm saying. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was downhill from there. So uh, yeah, watch what he uh, watch what he hands you. How now? Are you still making the wood baits, or are you just doing the soft plastics? Um, I still um, do hard baits as well. I'm actually sitting in my basement right now, just surrounded by baits that are in different stages of <laughs> being completed, or so. Yeah, I've always got stuff going on. Um, yeah, I just for the for the show, it's like I can crank out soft plastics like considerably faster than I can hard baits. Um, so I it, it took me like a year to get everything that I brought to the Columbus show to to make all that. Sure, um, but it's really like, you know full time job, wife, kids. So it's like I'm doing it pretty much in the mornings. I I'm a morning person ever since the military. I get up four or five o'clock and usually hang out drink coffee and work on baits so oh jesus i don't think that yeah that's i'm more of an evening person uh yeah me in the morning as like somebody said you know have you ever uh have you ever caught a fish before 6 a.m i go i don't know if i've ever seen before 6 a.m i didn't even know there was two of them uh it uh yeah it's been a while since i uh have done the early morning thing but well that's pretty cool mike you guys fish some crane baits up there don't you or yeah yeah a little bit you know twitch baits of all sorts but uh yeah i have a few crane baits in the arsenal sure now for guys that don't know you're fishing up in the hayward lakes area there you're uh um any lake in any lakes in particular you kind of specialize on Honestly, I'm fishing in six different counties in northwestern Wisconsin, so um, it all really depends on the people that I have in the boat's goals for the day. You know, if they if they want to go on an action trip, you know, we'll go to a puddle and try to get some action, and then I'll, uh, you know, we get that done out of the way, try to get them to move on to a bigger and badder lake, try to steal the deal on a big fish, and um, the thing about northwestern Wisconsin is, 
there are no lakes within 45 minutes to an hour of one another that contain big fish. So you got to put on a lot of miles to, to find these lakes. And if they're on, they're on. If they're off, they're off. So sure, do a lot of traveling up here. It's not really smart on the, on the whole money making thing, but <laughs> you know, I want to I want to put fish in the boat and big ones in it. Damn it! <laughs> yeah, I get I get yeah. that. Uh, the, Colin, have you ever fished up in Wisconsin? I have not, no. Um, mainly Ohio, West Virginia, and uh, a little bit in Kentucky. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, you know, the main thing I learned about Wisconsin when I was up there 20 years ago is just make sure that you're in a lake. When you're muskie fishing, make sure the lake you're fishing has muskies in it because yeah. <laughs> that, that, I, would, that would be a plus. <laughs> I did not do that one time um because it was back when you know wisconsin it was you know i was fishing everybody said go to sand lake well how many sand lakes are there in wisconsin mike gosh 200 i couldn't tell you about a few hundred probably. yeah a yeah yeah <laughs> well i i went and fished one and i was i hadn't seen a fish all day and i was talking to these guys that were walleye fishing I was like, hey you guys doing any good and they go, ah, we caught a couple of walleyes. And they said, what are you fishing for? And I go, musky. And he goes, well, there's no musky in this lake. I go, that's probably why I haven't caught any. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, make sure there's muskies in the lake um, that you're fishing. But, uh, Mike, how was your season last year in northern Wisconsin? You know, the 2023 Gosh, you know, season. It was, uh, it, it was, uh, and honestly, it was just like a great, great season. Um, all around for the summer was kind of slow for big fish, but numbers of smaller fish were, were very hungry. Um, I think a lot of that had to do with the cool water temperatures that we had. Um, I mean, there was a time in late July, early August where our water temps did peak out at around that 78 to 81 degrees. And a few days later, we had uh, finally a big south wind for three days straight. And uh, it was a warm south wind, pretty pretty normal. And uh, that water temp dropped from, what I said, 78, 81 degrees all the way down to 68 degrees. Sure. So we never had any wind up here all summer long. It was the windless, most windless year I've ever seen. And uh, so, yeah, it just that we had cold water. So those big fish were acting really, really cold all year long. Um, but, uh, but fast forward into the fall, it turned out to be just absolutely fantastic. A lot of, uh, a lot of big Northern Wisconsin muskies hit the net this year. Um, lost quite a few as well, unfortunately, but especially with suckers, that'll happen. Sure. Um, but ha being able to fish until December 30th, I think was my last day out. Um, when the season closes on the 31st, it was just unbelievable. And, uh, we had opportunities all the way up to the, to the end. I just couldn't go one more day. I was done. <laughs> yeah. You guys, uh, you guys, that's the latest. That's gotta be some of the latest that anyone's fished up there, right? Oh yeah. You know, I would think so. Um, unfortunately I kind of. I kind of pushed out and I went down south for two weeks. Um, so I fished my last two weeks of the season down just, you know, Madison area, Conwalk area. I scooted over to Big Green a little bit um, just because that was guaranteed to stay open. But um, my brother in law did catch a 48 and a half, uh, 30, 35 pounder on the 27th of December in Hayward. Wow. Which is unbelievable. Nice. Yeah, no. For, for up here to say that you caught a fish that big um, that late in the season, which, like you said, I don't think a lot of people have ever got to legally fish for muskies out of a boat um, during that time of year. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's pretty crazy. I know that. Well, I mean, even like right now, I mean, the, we're doing this podcast. Um, here it is, the last day of January. And in the northwest angle, it was 50 degrees today. Um, yeah. it's, it's just dumb how warm it is. And, and do you guys still have – do you guys have decent ice right now? We have about five inches of ice, and it's a lot, a lot of air pockets in there. It's, it wants to go whenever, it, you know, whenever we get a big, big warm-up. 
Um, but I don't think it's going to go anywhere anytime soon. But I am kind of excited for it. And I just know for a fact it's going to be a lot less harder on the fish mm-hmm. throughout the winter. Um, we've had some just unbelievable winters up here the past couple of years. So I'm kind of excited to see something like this because I just have to assume it's going to be a big bait year. It's going to be a good spawning year. You can't um, use the winter kill excuse. Um, yeah, exactly. That's always exactly. one of my good ones. I always like yeah, that. Yeah. That's that's. Uh, I use that one till about the early July, and then it's turnover. Um, sure. <laughs> after that. Um, yeah, so you think it's going to be pretty good? You know, I mean, that's that's really thin ice for you guys this late in the year, isn't it? Oh, it's unbelievable! Yeah, we don't have none of our snowmobile trails are open. Yeah, I, I haven't heard a snowmobile like in so long. Like normally, I should be hearing like hundreds upon you know thousands during the weekend. Yeah, um, I feel bad for the businesses, but I tell you what, it is quiet up here. And it is nice to travel on the ice. It's nice just being able to walk out there. Um, I hate ice fishing, but I've kind of <laughs> enjoyed it over the past couple of weeks. Colin, uh, Colin, how is the uh, snowmobile traffic by you? Uh, pretty non-existent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what, 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 what part of Ohio are you in, Colin? I'm in Columbus. Okay, so yeah, I don't, you know, you don't see uh, Columbus, Ohio, as a snowmobiling destination um, too often. So, yeah, I don't. <laughs> even up at the angle, I mean, they're not getting uh, near the snow or you know near the the ice that we should. I mean, they're even talking. Uh, I, I'd even heard rumors. I'm not up there right now. I'm going back uh, next week after the. Um, Thorn Brothers event, uh, they're talking uh, of even, you know, not, you know, pulling some of the houses and not going out as far on the ice. It's just been a bad ice year, you know? Yeah. Um, yep. And I, I think it's been that way everywhere. And I mean, even in the angle up there, I mean, you know, that's, I mean, we are the polar vortex. Uh, and it's, yeah, just not, not great. How's the snow in Wisconsin? Do you guys have much snow? No, like I said, like the snowmobile trails aren't even open due to the lack of snow. We might we might have four or five inches on the ground. Yeah, yeah, that's the angle might have ten inches. It's not it's not a lot uh, by any no. means. I'm sure it'll probably get dumped on in March. You know, something stupid like that. Um, but yeah, I I just don't get it. I don't understand it, and. Uh, uh, it's it's pretty annoying, but um, Colin, let's talk about. Oh, the... I'm loving it. What? It, it was 40 <laughs> degrees up here, Greg. It shouldn't be this warm. Oh, here. and Hayward, there's people laying out with like the little mirrors, getting the sunburn. Um, oh, absolutely. There's there's people. Yeah, that... I saw some guys out playing volleyball the other day. It's oh my! Nuts. Well, that's <laughs> de- that definitely is a Hayward thing. Volleyball in the snow. Um, what? Uh, not for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, you don't have enough hair. Um, the uh, what's the um, in the year? What was maybe some some techniques and stuff that that really was there any like new ones this year or something you learned that might be um, that 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 you hadn't done in the past? Yeah, you know, um, you know I dabbled a little bit with it last year, but. Um, Really slowing down small bucktails midday was really good. Seems like those these fish aren't even looking at double tens anymore. Um, I, everything's full, you know, just one big rotating circle. Um, not saying that tens are out by any means, but you got to throw something smaller and you got to throw something really slow. And it was amazing um, the quality of fish that were going on such tiny baits moving at which should be flying by most standards, you know, small bucktails mm-hmm. mid-summer, but they didn't want them fast. They wanted them slow, slow, slow. Interesting. Yeah, and were yeah. these fish were these fish your contact in shallower fish, or were these fish you are finding out deeper? No, you know, I would say deep being like 14 feet of water. Um, and in, that, know, in, that, in that 14 feet, in, in that 14 feet, sorry, I'm just uh, – question here um in that 14 feet 
is that the weed edge or is that off the edge? You know, not necessarily. A lot of these lakes up here are in the dark stained waters. I do get out on the Cisco bodies of water at certain times of the year um, and hit them pretty hard as well. But um, that's, you know, weed edges are primarily in that five to eight foot range. Sure. But um, a lot of these small, darker bodies of water, um, or I shouldn't say small um, because they can be large as well. uh, There's a tremendous amount of perch in there. Um, And these perch, for some reason, don't grow much above five to six inches. Sure. And they're just loaded and they swim up and down those sand breaks. So a lot of times, especially when we were in the small bucktail program, we were fishing where the perch were and they, those perch were anywhere from in the weeds all the way out cruising to about like 14 to 16 feet of water at its deepest. Okay. But, uh, just swim up and down that sand edge, you know, the contact weeds will swim out and the muskies do the same thing. So. Kind of figured that out, moving out a little bit deeper with that presentation, just due to the amount of fish that we were marking in the sand versus the ones that were actually on the weed edge. Okay. Um, so I I don't know if those muskies are necessarily sitting there. They I'm guessing they're cruising more than likely. So getting on them and you know really slowing it down, um, they just have more time to see it as well. Yeah. Um, Colin, now at the show. You had your soft plastic baits. How did yep. those? How did those come about? Um, honestly, for years I never even ran soft plastics uh, until I started um, fishing with uh, one of my buddies, Malik, and his brother John, and um, they were just running a lot of different types of soft plastics, uh, mainly like the um, the Hellbenders, uh-huh. um, and. They- they were just landing a lot of fish and I was like, all right, maybe, I, maybe I need to try soft plastics. Uh, and naturally my, my head goes to, okay, well, how do I make them myself? Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how I got into the soft plastics in like the past two years. And, um, yeah, it's interesting. It, it's like a, an interesting transition, uh, going from like making hard baits for so many years to, to trying soft plastics. It's, um, it's kind of a different world, but like, once you get everything set up and you you get into a rhythm, it's it's nice how how much faster you can kind of crank out some baits. Oh yeah, I mean it's just it's all about the mix. Um, yeah, and uh, and doing it that way. What's the uh, on your your soft plastics now to give people an idea? Um, what sizes are you making? And because yours is a very lifelike sucker um, looking soft plastic. Is that the only one that you make? Um, yeah, so we make the, the sucker, uh, the hog sucker, as I call it. Um, and then I had a, a little smaller one at the show uh, that I call the spring fling. Um, and that one was actually kind of the like prototype leading into um, the larger hog sucker. Like that was like the first kind of soft plastic I wanted to try. I just want to try something like small. Um, and I think I think it was around the springtime when I was messing around with it so i want something tiny for spring um we've just found that during the spring a lot of a lot of the fish in the creeks will will chase after tiny baits so okay and they're not made for for going uh you know super deep or anything these are made for because you're in shallower creeks i think you told me that you know you're looking at only getting down like a foot or so right yeah yeah so i i try to keep my baits like usually within the uh, one foot to like three foot range you know obviously if you cast it out there and you let it sit down or you know sink down it would it would eventually get deeper and i mean i can always throw more weight in them but yeah i mean for our type of fishing um it's a lot better to have a bait that's not real heavy and doesn't dive real fast just because we're fishing really close to the banks really close to structure um and it's nice to have a bait that you know, if you want to toss on the other side of some, some logs and some timber to be able to bring it up real quick and kind of bring it up over that, that log and then let it come back down a little bit. So, sure, yeah, I, I make all my stuff like a little on the lighter side, like even my, my big um, seven inch hog suckers, like only six ounces. So, okay. So yeah, it can stay pretty high and it makes it easier to, to work it through the, the structure and stuff. Now, are you painting those? Some of those you had were painted. Were you doing that? 
Yes. Yep. Oh my painful. God. How does that stuff, that stuff stinks. Uh, it does stink. Um, <laughs> you, I mean, I, I know guys that paint like Jeff Boggs that does the, the Boggs custom, which I think has some of the best, um, soft plastic paint jobs there is. And oh, yeah. I mean, that stuff, it's not, you know, may cause cancer. It's like will cause cancer. I mean, this stuff is nasty. Um, is that the stuff you're using? Um, no, so I, I'm using a, a different kind. I actually was looking into that other paint though, but it, it's like you're saying that that paint is extremely toxic. So <laughs> yes, you know, but, yes, you know, looking at that paint, but I'm also looking at like the full face, you know, air supply respirator, which is like a thousand bucks. I'm like, okay, do I, <laughs> do I really pilot, want that? Pilot the co-pilot. You know, um, you know, uh, yeah, I think with the paint I have, um, it, I, I'm looking at doing like the the clear coat for uh, just like that that toxic kind of stuff. It's just a clear coat. I don't know if I would actually jump straight into the paint, but I would like to be able to clear coat them. But it's it's kind of like the I, I've learned with this paint that I am using um, that as long as you prep the bait pretty well, like I, I scrub every bait down and wash all like that soft plastic oil off um that it, it holds up pretty well um you know like the thing with soft plastic is you know their their life expectancy in comparison to a hard bait is already going to be considerably shorter you know you can you can do the the plastic surgery as i call it where you're busting out like the the super glue or if you need to heat something up and kind of fuse pieces back together but you know they naturally they just don't last as long as hard baits but um yeah i mean i i tested the paint out i've been i've been running it for like a year now um i even i have a test a little aquarium test tank that i obviously like weigh my baits in and and test them there and i i painted some just soft plastics and just tossed them in that water and let them sit there for like five or six months underwater just to like when i first got the paint i was like kind of skeptical because i was like all right this isn't the toxic stuff but like like how well is it going to hold up if if the bait's underwater for you know a while is it just going to like all just come off <laughs> and that's like what I was thinking so like I, I I was able to like reassure myself by like basically leaving baits underwater for multiple months and you know the the soft plastic itself actually started discoloring before the paint did anything and honestly the paint came out looking to the same way it did when I painted it on my but, style of painting would be kind of like the. Uh the Paz Easter egg painting kit where you put it like in the little, in the little, uh, uh, metal bracket and you dip the egg down in there. I could see me doing it that way and it looking yep. <laughs> like dog shit. Um, I'm sure that, uh, I'm sure yours is a lot better. You had, you had some really, really cool paint jobs, very natural, um, sucker type yeah. stuff. And I mean, and that's your main, uh, that's your main, you know, forage and, you know, especially if you're Creek fishing, um, now is that primarily what you fish or do you do much lake stuff or? No, I don't do like any lake stuff or any of the reservoirs in Ohio. Um, I am, uh, strictly creeks and rivers. So are you John boat or jet boat? Um, John boat. Okay. Um, yeah, I want a jet boat, but no one will sell me one for cheap. Um, yeah. so that's uh that's the problem what about you mike do you ever fish any of the rivers up there in uh hayward no no not a whole lot i can't get my boat in there and if i i i can't uh afford another toy yes as much as i'd like to have a jet boat as well but uh no i i did a lot of river stuff down south uh the wisconsin river i used to pound that growing up but um yeah, not so much up here anymore. It's real skinny water. Not uh, not good for a twenty foot of Luma craft. <laughs> uh, no, no, it isn't. What was the? Uh, you know, is there anybody up there that's that's doing the river stuff much? Yeah, you know, uh, my good friend Chris Willen, he does a lot of the rivers all around up here. He's kind of like me. He's bouncing all over county to county. Um, but uh, Willen is awesome. Um, very good out on the rivers up here. Yeah. And, um, doesn't yeah, he... I have done some stuff with him. Um, I, I guess I, I forgot about that. Um, but I've always had a great time with him. He showed me some really cool stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I, I really, in the, I'm getting more and more into river fishing myself and I take my, my ranger tiller, um, 
you know, if I can get it in there, I'll, I'll, I'll go, but it sometimes ain't the smartest thing to do. Uh, but, oh, no. but I, I was doing that a lot this December. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I do really like fishing river stuff and that's, that kind of caught, that's why it kind of caught my eye with your, with your baits up there. What colors are you making? Are you just mainly making the, uh, sucker patterns? Call it. Um, yeah, I, I would say my favorite patterns to do are, are definitely natural. Um, I did have some in the sucker pattern that were like, I call it the goldfish. It was just kind of like a, a bright gold or I'm sorry, a bright orange with uh, some gold tinting. Um, but I actually like, I would say like, I didn't finish the molds and everything for that lure until like, uh, like a couple months ago prior to the show. So like, I don't like, cr- I was cranking those out like <laughs> over time to get those for ready for the show. And, um, I just wanted to, to put out a bunch of natural ones just cause that's my personal favorite. But, um, yeah, there's, I definitely want to keep pouring some, some funky colors too. So it's always fun. That's why that's kind of the cool thing about soft plastics is it's like, like the sky's the limit. I mean, you can just get wild and just start mixing all sorts of colors and glitters and color shift pigments, um, and, and really kind of make up your own stuff. Yeah, no, I I definitely uh, agree with you there that they're that these baits are um, the soft plastics. You do have a lot of a lot of options, and you know yours though. I, like I said, I, I thought the the you know the colors that you had, the paint jobs, all that were really really good, and and it was pretty amazing how they uh, how they looked. But uh, oh, thank you. No, no, it was. So, Colin, what's the what what's the biggest fish you've caught on one of your baits? Um, actually, on one of mine, I would say sadly it's only a forty. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm still naturally like any musky fisherman. I lost bigger ones. Um, actually, I lost a, a pretty good sized one. I was probably forty five, forty six on that newer hog sucker. Um. And I, the biggest that I've seen caught on my baits, I think it's like 44 or 45 that I've witnessed. Um, my buddy, uh, Malik, I, I call him big musky Malik. It's like every time I take this dude out fishing, he just like is guaranteed to stick a 40. And, um, uh, he's been fishing my baits for years. Um, uh, he was actually one of the guys that was like, dude, you need to do a show. You know, I, I think people will buy these. So, um, gotta give a shout out to him and his brother. They, they've supported me and they've been fishing my baits for a long time, along with my other buddy, uh, Bill and John. So, well, that's cool. At least they're, uh, um, it sounds like, uh, guys are getting some fish on them and, and, uh, you know, catching some, uh, catching some stuff, but you're also fishing creeks that don't have the population of the, of the real bigger fish in them too, I would say. Right. Yeah. Um, there, I mean, there's still some some pretty big fish that we've come across. Um, the biggest one that I've seen is 47 and a half um, landed. We've I've definitely seen. I uh, was like two years ago, a 51, 52, in, in a certain creek in Ohio that was an absolute just giant. Um, and when you're talking creek, you're talking creeks, though, right? You're talking, uh, yeah, 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 skinny, like- skinny water. I mean, I've floated creeks here and in Kentucky, you know, like, uh, Tigret and Kinney Kinnick and, and those, yep. and they're creeks. I mean, to kind of give okay. you an idea, Mike, we're talking about areas that are maybe 20 feet wide. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. You know, oh, I'm, I'm well aware of that. Like real skinny <laughs> stuff. <laughs> but, skinny, skinny water. Yeah. And it, you know, and there are some big fish that, that live in that and it, it, they, they scare the living dog shit out of you when they oh, yeah. come up and like, come up and bite and you're in that little boat and I'm really bad at standing and all that good stuff. Uh, yeah. they, so that's like the main reason why I, I'm just like so obsessed with the, with the Creek muskies. It's just, it just never ceases to amaze me uh, to see these massive predators in these tiny little creeks. Sure. That you would, you know, you would never guess to see a fish of that caliber come out of like this tiny little pocket in a Creek. Yeah, no, I, uh, I totally, uh, I totally get that. 
But uh, man, you don't see jet skiers or pontooners. I think you're too. in a pretty good area. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say we rarely, rarely run into other people when we're out on the water. I, I could probably count on both my hands how many times in, in the past seven or eight years that we've ever even ran into anybody else. So I mean, it's it's a grind. I mean, you know, you usually come out of every trip exhausted from you know having to pull over and go through riffles. Um, you're usually covered in mud. Uh, like it's it's kind of I refer to it as kind of like gorilla fishing. Like it's sure. I've uh You're getting tired. <laughs> I've done it uh I've done it before. Um it's definitely yeah. We floated the um the Red River in the gorge. Okay. I don't know if you've ever fished it. Um down here in the in the natural bridge, the Red River Gorge and and it's oh my god, it's a lot of pulling and I, I fished a creek last uh two years ago with Jason Jackson in Huntington and uh yeah, it was a lot of pulling, a lot of, a lot of stuff, but, uh, yeah. it is, uh, it is a lot of fun though. When they're going though, it's, uh, it's, it is. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty wild. I mean, if, when you can get out on a day where the fish are just lit up, it is nuts. I mean, but yeah, that's just, I fished, uh, the river in West Virginia with, um, my buddy, Derek Tucker of, uh, Lucky Tucklers. He makes some sick glide baits. Um, and he's got, I think like a 14 foot. Um, boat i forget what type but like i i met him out and went you know, fishing with him and it was just like kind of surreal to me because uh, i just still came back kind of tired but i was like i'm not dirty <laughs> this is interesting like i'm not covered in mud i didn't have to bring waders i was like this is this is wild <laughs> this is nice oh yeah this is how Man. the other half live that's yeah. uh <laughs> that's good that's good Oh, Mike, we're going to be talking there at the uh, Muskie Road Rules event in uh, Mosinee down at uh, Sportsman's Repair. What? Uh, give me a little taste of what we're going to be talking about. Yeah, you know, I'm going to do my little segment on maximizing your time, um, unlimited time. I feel like a lot of people that come up to northern Wisconsin, um, travel to Minnesota, even other destinations, too. Um, you know, a lot of times you're up here for a weekend. Um, you know, with the exception of Canada, usually people go up there a lot longer. But, you know, they're, the serious fishermen are out for the weekend, typically. Um, if you get a family that comes up here for a week, um, underline the word family in that so you might have a serious fisherman come up with his family and that guy is not going to be able to fish as hard as he wants to i guarantee you um you gotta spend time with your family but, you gotta um, get to the casino jesus <laughs> bet on black that's what oh i say oh my god <laughs> I don't. I don't even go into those places. To do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fishing guide. I don't have those kind of funds. <laughs> yeah. Well, trust me. But, uh, me. Me neither. Yeah. So, I just want to talk about like you know showing up to new water, breaking down a lake. Um, some of my favorite tactics throughout the year during certain times of the year, so on and so forth. So it should be a. It'll be a good presentation. I hope to see a lot of people there. I'm excited for it. Well, no, it'll be, uh, it'll be good. It's Jim puts on a, Jim has a great little, uh, shop there. I always end up spending way more money than I should when I go there. Cause I ended up buying something. Uh, and he's got, you know, anything from, I mean, the man knows reels, he knows rods, he knows trolling motors, he knows electronics. Um, guys, if you come to this thing, you're going to learn a lot of stuff, if you're in a, if you know if you're thinking about getting new electronics for your boat or or uh if you're thinking about getting um anything you know whether it be something for uh, the forward facing sonar whether it be you know just getting your reels repaired this is a guy uh this is a shop a place that you need to hit sportsman's repair there in uh in Mosinee and they'll uh he'll have everything and and plus we've got uh Nate Osfar will be there Nate uh is a buddy of mine that's won a lot of him and his partner uh Matt Rayley have won a lot of money in the PMTT they'll be doing a good talk and then Gus Matley um who or Gus Manty it's not Matley I always get in trouble for that um will be uh doing talks well about uh northeastern Wisconsin um, I think it's going to be a great, 
uh, event. It's going to be a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, so hopefully Saturday we can see you guys there. And then if you're in Minnesota and you want to come to the Thorn Brothers deal, I think you're going to really like that too. It's always fun to go to Thorns and uh, see what they got and see Luke and uh, the other uh, group from uh, Fish Electronics to, again, um, electronics have become such a huge part of musky fishing, especially lake uh, musky fishing and uh, learning how to, you know, with the side imaging, the forward facing and just, you know, understanding how to read everything. It's it's become a huge, huge part of it. Um, but yeah. So, Cullen, how can somebody get a hold of you to get some baits or do they, is it like a secret handshake? <laughs> um. I think the, the best way to probably get a hold of me at the moment is uh, just to shoot me a message either through uh, my Instagram or uh, the Facebook. Instagram is probably the better, um, faster option. I'm, I usually hop on there a little more than Facebook these days. But, um, yeah, at the moment, um, I don't have, like, a website or anything. But um, I will be at the Elk River Show if anybody uh, in that area wants to come out. And I'll be bringing uh, the baits that I have left over to, to sell there and, hopefully meet some meet some new guys in that area so sure so what is the what's the name of the uh instagram page uh creek hog baits creek hog baits well there you go mike hog is h-a-w-g <laughs> h-a-w-g there you go um mike how uh how about you how can somebody get a hold of you uh, yeah, you can reach me on my cell phone. It's area code 608 695 9073. Otherwise, my email is hanson.michael608 at gmail.com. My website is naguideservice.com, Namakagan Area Guide Service. So, well, non alcoholic guide. I go, well, that's not a very fun fishing guide. Oh, man. I, I actually I haven't had a drink in three days. It's pretty crazy. Oh, my God. No wonder you're convulsing. I hear the shakes in your voice. Um, I know. I need to get off the phone. I'm getting <laughs> thirsty over here. No. <laughs> what? Um, now, 608, that's a, is that a Madison number? Correct. Correct. Yeah. I moved up, uh, I moved up here about, what is it? Six years ago now. So gotcha. What brought you up there? Just fishing? Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I had an opportunity to work at a resort up here and, uh, the guy told me, you know, if I worked for him and, uh, I'd be full-time guiding in three years and he wasn't wrong. In fact, uh, he was a little wrong. I was doing that within two years. So nice. Um, nice. Yeah, it was just a uh, it was a good opportunity, and you know Madison was a cool place to grow up in, but I did not want to live there for the rest of my life. It is a crazy, crazy city. Do they still uh, have the place Smut and Eggs? Uh, I don't know. I don't think they have that anymore. I think uh, I think enough people complained about it finally. <laughs> Colin, I mean, just if you turn in, they got soft. <laughs> Colin, have you ever heard of Smut and Eggs? No, it was not. a breakfast joint that was open all night and they played porno on these giant 60 inch TVs while you're wow. eating waffles. Okay. Um, so it was, erotic. it was super weird. I ended up there one night. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's not what you're expecting <laughs> when you're ordering bacon and there is, Yo, there's man. things going on all over uh, around and, yeah, it it is. Uh, that was one of the weirder places I've been to. One of the weirder places. Yeah, I've never been to it, but I heard stories about it. Oh, like, God. Yeah, I don't need to go see that. I heard they were all like 70s pornos. Oh, there. God, like, yes, yeah. yes. There was. No, I don't need to be sitting next to a 60 year old guy. <laughs> there was no. There was. There was. There, yeah, there was no trimming uh, going on. It was. Uh, yeah, it was pretty wild. But, uh, well, guys, hey, thanks for coming on tonight. Thanks for uh, talking a little bit. And uh, as always, make sure you check out Musky Road Rules, guys. Um, we got this weekend coming up in uh, Mosinee and then Sunday at Thorn Brothers. And then next Saturday, we're going to be in Nishwa, the Brainerd area. And we'd love to uh, have you guys come out. Guys, thanks for coming on. Always a pleasure. And I will talk to you guys later. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Hey, thanks for having us. See you.